What an honor it is for me to introduce Dr. Francis Henderson this afternoon as our keynote speaker for this year's MLK celebration at Maryville College. Our friendship started in 2007 when I was her mentor as she taught in our political science department. We connected through our diversity work and were reminded each year that there were very few of us faculty of color on campus. In fact, in 2013, 194 years after Maryville College's founding, she became the first African-American woman to be awarded tenure here. Currently, she is Professor of Gender and Women's Studies in African-American and Africana Studies at the University of Kentucky. Henderson's research centers around a vested intellectual and academic interest in intersectionality, examining the ways in which gender, race, class, and region shape the use of religion in social justice movements, especially here in the South. She specializes in black political thought, black feminist theory, and social movements in the diaspora. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Frances Henderson as she speaks to us about reclaiming Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. and thank you all for that fabulous, fabulous greeting. Um, before I go any further, though, I just want to shout out the MLK Mass Celebration Choir, because y'all are giving me life right now. So they, they are killing it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today in a place that I consider home. Thank you to the Blount County Martin Luther King Celebration Committee for the invitation and the chance to come and be with you all again. I titled this talk, Reclaiming Martin Luther King Jr., because that is exactly what I intended to be, a reclamation of his legacy, taking him back from the whitewashed version that we as a nation currently propagate and push on our children. In a moment when white conservatives like Mike Pence invoke, invoke Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, that one day all of our children, regardless of race, color, or creed, will be able to sit side by side at a table as he defends the construction of a border wall, and turns a blind eye to the detention centers that hold migrant children at the border, it's time to reclaim Dr. Martin Luther King. <laughs> at a time when those in power signed Martin Luther King Day Jr. proclamations with one hand and cut social services and economic safety nets with the other, Martin Luther King Jr. needs to be reclaimed. <laughs> When Ram uses Martin Luther King Jr.'s voice and words to sell trucks in a Super Bowl ad, it is time to reclaim, no, rescue Martin Luther King Jr. from the offensive, antithetical, whitewashed, mythical version and the misuse of his image. So today I want to spend some time reclaiming him and bringing to light the evolution of Martin Luther King Jr. in the period after the I Have a Dream speech and right before his death. I want to suggest that this whitewashed version of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. not only allows him to be misused, but it obscures the radical nature of his work in the months, days, and years before his death. And it obscures his calls for America to take a good look at itself and for white Americans to examine privilege. In his 2018 article, Why Martin Luther King Jr. Was Hated Before He Died, historian James Cobbs notes Martin Luther King Jr.'s 90% approval rating among Americans in 2018. Cobb says, yet the basis for today's approval rating north of 90% can be captured succinctly in carefully cropped newsreel footage of King's countless confrontations with vicious, inflammatory bigots and his 
magnificent oratory that day in August in 1963 at the Lincoln Memorial, when achieving his dream seemed largely a matter of rallying his countrymen against institutionalized racism and persecution in the South. But this overly narrow historical memory typically serves a purpose. And in this case, it is far more comforting to focus on Dr. King's success in making the bad part of the country better than to contemplate his equally telling failures to push the country as a whole to become what he knew it should be. This carefully cropped, I'm sorry, end quote, this carefully cropped newswheel represents a shallow understanding of Martin Luther King Jr. And shallow understandings are always problematic. Those of you who've taken classes with me know exactly what I'm talking about. So today, I'll say a little bit more about shallow understanding and the obscuring of a Martin Luther King Jr. who was much more critical of the relationship between economic injustice and racial injustice and white privilege. A couple days ago, my youngest, Josie, the third grader, came home and told me that in anticipation of the Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration, they were spending time talking and learning about Martin Luther King Jr. during her social studies class. I said, really? What are you learning about him? She said that he helped in segregation against African Americans. Well, how did he do that, I asked her. And at this point, she's like, oh, Mom. <laughs> well, how did he do that, I asked her. And she said, well, what they said at school was that he marched for African Americans' right to vote in the South. But Mama, at home, we talked about how Martin Luther King Jr. didn't only march in the South, but that he tried to help people. He went to jail, he helped people in the North fight for better pay, safe places to work, more jobs, and decent places to live. But they didn't talk about that in school. I asked her, why do you think that is? Maybe they don't know, she said. Maybe they don't know. A third grader's generous, if not accurate, reading of the depth and the extent to which the nation remembers, honors, and understands Martin Luther King Jr. The acceptance of this maybe they don't know attitude has very serious implications for the way that we remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., how we employ him in our activism, and how we allow others to appropriate him. Here I am reminded of perhaps a less well-worn quote from Martin Luther King Jr. It goes as follows. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. End quote. Let that sink in for a moment. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute under misunderstanding from people of ill will. What does this mean? What does this mean for the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? It means that the shallow understanding or knowledge of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. allows well-intentioned people to tell our children only one-third of the story of MLK's life and work to highlight the kumbaya aspect and laud him for his peaceful nonviolent tactics without situating them within the broader trajectory of his evolution or of his refusal to later roundly condemn the use of violence to achieve justice, saying, quote, that saying that a riot is the language of the unheard and what is it that America has failed to hear? It has failed to hear that the promises of freedom and justice have not been met. And it has failed to hear that large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice and humanity. This is not represented in the shallow understanding of Martin Luther King. This shallow understanding fails to ignite significant outrage and encourages well-intentioned people to turn a blind eye to the use of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the service of ideals and goals that are clearly antithetical to what he stood for. In my opening, I'm still good? Okay. In my opening, I gave the example of Ram using his image in a commercial. You might remember this 2018 Ram um, truck Super Bowl commercial, which eerily used Dr. King's voice and words to sell pickup trucks. It went like this. Over the backdrop of video of neighbors helping neighbors and images of Asian, Hispanic, white, and black people helping each other in service projects, the ad superimposed Dr. King saying the following. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's the new definition of greatness. By giving that definition 
of greatness, it means that everyone can be great. And by giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great. You don't have to know about Plato and Aristotle to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. And you don't have to know the second theory of therm thermodynamics um, in physics to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant, close quote. And Ram added, and this truck will help you. <laughs> to use Martin Luther King Jr.'s words, visage, and voice to sell trucks during the Super Bowl, a racist critique of capitalism and consumerism that he developed as he was working around the crisis of northern ghettos, workers' rights, and economic inequality at the moment of writing that very same speech from which the text is pulled. According to Michael Eric Dyson, by 1966, Dr. King had already recognized and articulated the dangers of consumerism. In this speech, entitled The Drum Major Instinct, Dr. King outlines the drum major instinct as humans need to be recognized, and the central role of our egos in consumerism, and dictating how we live, interact with people, and try to feed the ego. Then he says the following about consumerism in this speech. Now the presence of this instinct, that is the drum major instinct, explains why we're so often taken by advertisers. You know, those gentle, massive verbal persuasion, those, those gentlemen of massive verbal persuasion. And they have a way of saying things to you that kind of gets you into buying. Like, in order to be a man of distinction, you must drink this whiskey. In order to make your neighbors envious, you must drive this type of car. In order to be lovely and to love, you must wear this kind of lipstick or this kind of perfume. And you know, before you know it, you're buying that stuff. And that's the way advertisers do it, end quote. He goes on to say this about the drum major instinct and American consumerism. But seriously, it goes through life. Consumerism and the drum major instinct, instinct is real. And it often causes us to live above our means. Do you ever see people buy cars that they can't even begin to buy in terms of their income? But it feeds a repressed ego. And they just live their lives trying to outdo the Joneses. And I gotta drive this car, this ramp truck, because it's something about this ramp truck that makes my car a little better than my neighbor's car. This, end quote, this, he says, is the heart of one of the evils of which America is guilty, endless consumption and consumerism. And I'll quote him one more time, he says, and I am sad to say that the nation in which we live is the supreme culprit, and I'm going to continue to say it in America. Now, wait for it. Did you realize that the text from that Ram Super Bowl speech was taken from the exact same speech that I just read for you where King criticizes American consumerism and ego? Yeah, right? With the permission and support of some of the members of the estate of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, they, Ram got the approval of the use of the King's speech and voice in the ad, in which they said embodied Dr. King's philosophy that true greatness is achieved by serving others. Ram used this apolitical excerpt of the speech about service to sell trucks. It is, in a generous reading, the shallow understanding of Dr. Martin Luther King that allowed advertisers the audacity to use the excerpt of a speech against consumerism to promote consumerism. Without the context of the rest of the speech, Ram's commercial stands as an homage to the spirit of service, which is at the heart of the whitewashed, vis whitewashed visage of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it implies the approval of the civil rights icon of the company's attempt to highlight its corporate responsibility by urging others to be built to serve. And don't forget to show everybody you're built to serve by buying this truck. An accurate reading of this would be that this mistake demonstrates what happens when you don't have a diverse advertising room, when there are no people of color in the room, or even when I'm sorry, or even when in the face of inclusivity, people assume that we will consume the ad uncritically. Isn't it ironic that Ram would use Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s words to sell a truck during a Super Bowl that people were boycotting in order to bring attention to racial injustice? As one Twitter commented, use, as one user, sorry, as one Twitter user commented, it's a bold move to use Martin Luther King Jr. to sell Ram, Dodge Ram trucks during a game in a league that blackballed a man for speaking out against racism. Yikes. So the shallow understanding of Dr. Martin Luther King and the tone deaf use of, of his visage by people of any will is most harmful to us all. 
And I started with this, in this example of misuse of um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as an attempt to establish the ways in which our current celebrations of, of him allow people to overlook the more radical Martin Luther King Jr., whose words are quite prescient today. But now I want us to turn to a different, more radical um, Dr. King, who is obscured by that, and talk a little bit more outside of that shallow understanding. This is the Dr. King who had evolved after extensive struggle in civil rights in civil rights movements and the struggle for racial justice, and who had come to the realization that racial injustice was closely tied to economic injustice. Michael Eric Dyson says that by 1967, King had sensed the raging of a more powerful force than he had confronted in all of his years in civil rights struggles, the force of structural economic inequality. By this time, King had witnessed the entrenched nature of segregation based on economic policies such as redlining, steering, systemic under and unemployment of blacks, and fears of social contact between blacks and whites, all of which combined were quite effective at maintaining a racialized economic order in the North. Ways of knowing and doing in the North were much different than that in the South. And this realization had Dr. King moving in a direction of democratic socialism, isolating his fellow civil rights cohort with his analysis of race and class, and his call out, if you will, of the need to join race with an analysis of capitalism and militarism in considering the inequality in the country. He began raising questions about the distribution of wealth, thus questioning the capitalist economy and the redirection of funds that, it should, have been marked, that should have been marked for social services to military, military endeavors such as the Vietnam War. Again, Michael Eric Dyson says, this turn, this marks his turn from liberal reformer to radical revisionists who argued that fundamental American institutions needed to be made over in fairness to his poorest citizens. It was at this moment when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. articulated the connection between the racial privilege of whites and the economic conditions of blacks. Carefully considered, Martin Luther King Jr. said, many white Americans of goodwill have never connected bigotry with economic exploitation. They have deplored prejudice but tolerated or ignored economic injustice. Put differently, there are all types of terror that black communities are faced with, but only some of which makes white people, including politicians, policymakers, and those of goodwill, uncomfortable. So what does this mean in 2020? For example, it's cool and trendy to be about racial justice and Black Lives Matter when racial justice and Black Lives Matter are narrowly defined as an end to police brutality or overt acts of white supremacy. However, when it comes to, economic, to the economic justice aspect of racial inequality and Black Lives Matter, the story changes markedly because white the, what the fight for economic justice demands is the reevaluation of life and privilege that whiteness allows. A less shallow understanding of racial justice and, for instance, the Black Lives Matter movement would force black and white people to look at the way in which gentrification, the forced displacement, displacement of people of color, mainly black people, and other things represent the manifestation of white privilege over the fulfillment of a joint economic equality. It would mean that folks would not be able to turn away from the fact that the historical and continued legacy of unemployment redlining and subpar schools are the root cause of the racial wealth gap, wealth gap and not black people's inability to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It would mean that whites would further commit themselves to the idea of racial justice that necessarily requires that they relinquish privilege. It would, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., require that, quote, white Americans recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. The comfortable, entrenched, the privileged cannot continue to tremble at the prospect of the change in the status quo. I just came to make it plain. A less shallow understanding by people of goodwill requires a more shallow attachment to racial privilege. Plus, we seem to be going backwards. We see state lawmakers and policy implementers roll back voting rights by purging people from the rolls, by resisting reinstating voting rights of mostly black and brown formerly incarcerated people. We pat ourselves on the back when we are successful in attempts to remove blatant symbols of white supremacy 
while the very foundations that perpetuate generational poverty, illiteracy, and white supremacy still exist. Where is the collective outrage among whites over the chasms existing between black and white wages, generational wealth, poor literacy, low high school graduation rates, college degree attainment, suspensions, pushouts, imprisonments, unemployment, school funding, do I need to go on? <laughs> to why aren't these same folks who eschew blatant symbols of white supremacy deeply offended by the quote gentrification, deeply segregated housing and schools or race or racist school funding policies? The same the same folks upset by the images of the Confederate flag waving racists quietly are willing to use policy to stake a claim that they and their children are worthy of more and better rights than people of color. And that's Sharif el Keith. Any of the progress, as tenuous as it was, made in the last 60 years is being eroded piece by piece, brick by brick, and in some cases in large swaths. I do believe, I do believe it is true, as Dr. King said, that, quote, the majority of white Americans consider themselves committed to justice for the Negro. They believe that American society is essentially hospitable to fair play and to the steady growth toward a middle class utopia embodying racial harmony. Unfortunately, this is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity, close quotes. It is a fantasy of self-deception and comfortable vanity unless the privileged attacked all forms of injustice as vigorously as they stood against the overt hatred and racism of Charlottesville terrorists. And in this spirit, I offer some suggestions for, for moving forward as we begin to find ways to attack all forms of injustice. And these are suggested by a um, Philadelphia educational um, rights advocate named Sharif el Mekki. First, make covert forms of racism as socially unacceptable as Char Charlottesville. Make covert forms of racism as socially unacceptable as Charlottesville. This includes recognizing the absence of teachers of color in our schools, the uneven distribution of school funding and resources, disproportionate hiring practices, push out and educational practices. Number two, examine white privilege. Confront the realities that privilege, com privilege com comforts for you, yet oppresses others. As Dr. King said, the problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without the radical redistribution of political and economic power. Read and read some more, but try to avoid defensiveness while you're processing it. Fourth, find organizations that are doing things to disrupt and dismantle and engage in them. And last but not least, act with a sense of urgency. Thank you all for your time and for inviting me back. I hope this message has been engaging and provocative.